First of all, thanks, Mr. Khanna, BW Hotelier, and everyone present here for giving us this opportunity to talk about the not so uh, talked about departments, which are the procurement, housekeeping, and engineering. I'm taking this opportunity to showcase what we are, and I'm thankful to the panel who are here. Uh, this is the last session of the event. Two days have been really brilliant. Uh, in fact, I must uh, confess, I have been attending uh, BW Hotel here for all the session, all the events which has happened of BW Hotel in, in past several years. This is so far the best uh, BW Hotel here summit which I have attended. So thanks, uh, Mr. Khanna and the team. Uh, so namaskar. Uh, I am Dr. Nitin Nagrale. Today, uh, we will understand uh, what we have to do for the organizations and for India. Uh, India has been emerging uh, as a leader. In the last few years, uh, we have seen what uh, the current government has done. And uh, I have been watching a lot of these uh, TV shows, watching, uh, in fact, uh, in the last two days also, a lot of industry leaders talked about India being the next big thing. And uh, so, Today, all of us collectively, let's uh, see what we can do and what we have planned for uh, the country as such. Pandemic has taught us, pandemic has taught us many things. Uh, we also have gone through many issues, but uh, in those two years, what was working was the supply chain, uh, the housekeeping, and also the engineering. Engineering and uh, housekeeping were involved in not just maintaining those properties, though there were no guests, but then uh, you all were really, really working hard. And what was working was the supply chain wherein the, the staff or the guests or whoever were there in the organization and the hotels were taken care of. So uh, we have a great panel consisting of experts from these three departments and uh, we'll take it forward from here. So uh, it's gonna be a common question which I'll be asking first and then uh, we take it forward from there, ma'am. Uh, tough times make tough men or women. Uh, I want to ask you, all of you, a first common question first is, what have you done differently in pandemic, uh, which was not done before, in, uh, say, into 2020 and 21? Uh, what did you do differently, which was not done ever in your career? Should I yeah, So it's a, all of you can answer one by one. So good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, uh, thank you for choosing to be here. I know it's much more pleasant and exciting to be outside right now. So I'm really grateful that you have stayed back to listen to us. So thank you for that, first of all. I think, uh, of course, no, to, uh, I don't want to take away all the sadness and what uh, the pandemic you know, brought upon us, uh, humanity as such. But from a hoteliering uh, point of view, and especially for housekeeping, I think there is a lot of good that has been brought forward. And the first and foremost, uh, foremost is the fact that there's an extra uh, you know, importance and uh, the focus has come back on hygiene and sanitization. We've always had that, but pandemic has very much shown uh, to the entire hotel industry that housekeeping as a uh, department and all of us, all hoteliers are, is equal to a housekeeper. I do not think, and I'm a passionate housekeeper, uh, and I always believe that every hotelier, starting from the doorman, uh, to the housekeeper, to the FME, and all of us are housekeepers. So the most important thing that it is shown to all of us is to focus on hygiene and sanitization. Along with that, a few other things I think is also, it has taken away the frills that we've had in the rooms which were probably not required. We've all done away with the collateral that we uh, did not need. And I think most of the brands have not now uh, you know, brought them back. So that's another good that has happened. Uh, we have gone lean on our staffing. Uh, not to take away, uh, you know, to say that we become less, but I think we've been very, very uh, fortunate that we were able to uh, turn the pressure that all of us felt at that point of time into some kind of a passion. And uh, this is something that I always talk about, that uh, when we look at something like a pressure, it's, it becomes overbearing. But uh, I th I'll quote Kapil Dev in one of his interviews where he said that, uh, you know, when we all fall in love and uh, there is a lot of pressure to, uh, to please the other person, to look good, but we never take that as a pressure. We always take that as a passion. And I think the same at our workplace. We turned around during pandemic, the entire pressure. We turned it into passion to perform with the team that we had. And I think that these are so many uh, good takeaways that we had from the pandemic. And uh, thank you, BW Hotier, for choosing us as a panelist. Uh, what is we learned during this pandemic uh, 
on post pandemic is that uh, we have a challenge of the manpower on our duties during those days and we need to brought back the things back to the normal for the users for the uh, our customers so everything has been done in a such manner this has taught us if you do not have manpower sometimes you do not have space available but you need to go back to your uh, my engineering course when we go back to the books so what have we have done we learn we go back to the, our system back and regenerate entire engineering system back to the normal and that was a great learning and it taught us uh, this can happen any time so we have to be mentally prepared for those things and be ready for such uh, and it was a great learning for all of us as a engineering, engineering fraternity to redone back to the normal that is what big challenges for us because the system was almost uh, redundant for almost one and a half years 18 months there was no preventive maintenance was in place because of the manpower or there's no occupancies but we as a team all have come back learn from the things and put it back to normals so it is possible we can do the things with a uh, minimum manpower minimum spares things can come back to normals that also was a great learning for all of us so uh, in fact i before i move on to mr francis and uh, mr gupta both of you must have got an opportunity to do your maintenance and cleaning and hygiene and sanitation which was planned for the other period you i'm sure you must have done that as soon as you got the opportunity absolutely absolutely and there was a uh, good demand of from the customers things should be all touchless so we have tried to indigenous all the things uh, like lift cannot be touched so we, we made the panels uh, with the food operated kind of thing so these all been done by all of us uh, brilliant that uh, was a great learning for good evening friends uh, thank you for having us uh, as nitin said uh, you know being the panel between the end between the festivities beginning and now i think it's worth your time to hear what we have to say answering nitin's question i think the first thing that we learned is that how low can things go you know you look at the pandemic starting in and you feel that you know this is going to blow off in a few weeks then you feel that it may be not a few weeks but a few months and then you really see how things can get bad and you have no idea i mean all of us now have an idea but at that point looking in we have no idea how worse things can get how business can evaporate uh, not in months but not in weeks but in days and you are looking at ground zero literally and then when things start looking up you start celebrating you start removing your mask out comes delta and says that i have still not done i still got my time in the sun and it's more worse things are much worse so the next time when Omicron comes around, we feel that maybe it's another Delta. So let's prepare for that. But it gives a pleasant surprise. So I think that, you know, you cannot predict anything in this world anymore. Everything is volatile. Everything is uncertain. And one thing that the pandemic has learned is that resilience is the only characteristic probably that will keep you alive. The second thing we learned is that cash is king. You, you might have receivables. You might have payments to give. But... In, on those days, if you have cash in your hand, you know, you are going to be king. So do whatever possible to conserve it. Do whatever necessary to make sure that you have the runway to survive what is an uncertain horizon. The third is teamwork. You know, there is no point blaming each other because we are all in it together. So the question is always, how can we as a team emerge from this better? And sometimes you have to look beyond your department. You have to look at other functions and see what they can add to you. For example, we work with a finance function very closely to see what are the things we can do so as to make the little cash that we have stretch. And, you know, stretch in such a way that it still remains viable. So hopefully when things come back, you know, we are in a, we are in a better place. And the last thing is, I think, our actions affect an entire supply chain behind us. So we have suppliers who are dependent on us. We have our suppliers, suppliers who are dependent on us. And I think the one thing that we wanted to keep open for whatever we influence is to keep the communication lines open and say that, you know, this is what is happening. This So you don't have surprises which come, which kind of destroy them in a day. A lot of suppliers closed down. But whenever things came back, we always gave them first preference. And, and lastly, I mean, to just, just sum it up together is that, you know, Somebody has said, live today as if it is your last day. So if it is going to be your last day, what is it that you're going to do? And do all those things that you want to do. Okay, tall statement, but 
I think that is the general direction. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good evening and thanks, Nitin. Uh, I think almost everything has been said, but uh, some of the key learnings I would just encapsulate. Uh, there has been a very sharp focus on the business deliverables. So this period, these two years have taught us to see everything with a lens eye. The way it's going, uh, we should not be delighted and we should be looking at beyond on the alternative paths. So there, there has been a lot of focus on collaborative working, the second point, uh, internally as well as externally. So the way we were working before, two years before, the normal way, and the way we learned during these two years, you can see a lot of collaboration happening between the interfunctions within the hotel, within the company, and also simultaneously with the business partners. So the whole thing about looking at a buyer or a supplier concept is it totally vanished. It became just like a family. So, so the each critical, both of us became like hub and scope and, and, and it was just like a very collaborative working. Third thing is a lot of focus came on the technology. You know, before this people didn't think about how to improve, how to invest into innovation, how, how to have a touchless kind of experience for the guest journey, uh, how to have the reservations which could be without any human contacts, how to have some kind of IoT coming into the picture, into the room so guests can have an independent, touchless kind of experience. So those things people start thinking, a lot of investments, a lot of time was spent on uh, on looking for those kind of technologies uh, to give that kind of touchless experience. And lastly, there has been a lot of focus on the risk management as, as an organization. We never thought about, there was laid down policies and processes where the risk was being assessed, but this two years time made us to think much more deeply on the risk, enlist the risk, and have the action plans for the mitigation uh, for each one of them. And, and one more point could be on, on digitization. A lot of automation came into the picture, so a lot of meetings happening. Previously, it was a norm to have a face-to-face -face meetings, but these two years have taught us too much that even the work can be done without any face-to-face -face personal meetings. It, it, it became like a norm even today when the things are getting normal. A lot of work is happening through the uh, Zoom calls or, or electronically. So I think these are some of the key learnings which we, we had, and this paves the way to think forward in the times to come. Thank you. Yeah. So what's good is uh, we learned a lot uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we learned new things, new techniques, and new technologies. We revamped our departments and revised our own SOPs and manuals, uh, started reworking on the processes and procedures. Today, we have two uh, people representing the user department and two representing the procurement department. Every time, why should we have a panel uh, which is very amicable? Let's have a little bit of uh, masala and spice to it now. Uh, Ma'am and uh, Mr. Banerjee, I have a question for both the gentlemen sitting on your left. Uh, you work in your departments really hard. Uh, you work for several hours. Uh, but there is a frustration which comes in when the procurement doesn't supply you uh, products on time. Uh, you also many times are not very happy with the product which is coming or from where it is coming or the budgeting which has happened. What are your expectations, ideal expectations from a typical procurement department? What are the deliverables which you would expect from them? So this question is to both of you. Please feel free to answer. Sure, I'll go first. Uh, so I think uh, that's a very uh, a question which uh, Yusuf and I was just walking up the stage and we worked together for many years. And he mentioned, should we debate like we used to always? So uh, yes, uh, we've on many occasions, we've agreed to disagree with regards to our work, but we are great friends of the workplace. Uh, in terms of the kind of uh, expectations that are there, I think uh, from a housekeeping point of view towards procurement, it's very reasonable as always. Uh, we expect that the uh, knowledge sharing in terms of procurement is done while the process is on and not, uh, you know, after it is done. For example, uh, let's say if any, any item, let's say linen is uh, specifications are being drawn and you're looking for a vendor. So it is um, good that you discuss it with your housekeeper to say that these are the vendors, these are the sizes that they're giving, are they pre-washed, are they washed, 
what is the kind of, you know, the, the piping that you would want, so on and so forth. Uh, it is always good for both of the departments to have this kind of continuous and open communication. And uh, I must say it should be both ways, uh, not just one way. Uh, There's the open communication, sharing of knowledge while the process is on always uh, is uh, beneficial. With regards to the product after the procurement is done, and you know, there's another thing that uh, I must mention is the lead period on the pro in the products. There is always uh, a slip between uh, the lip, right? Because what the vendors uh, promise and the delivery, there is oftentimes there is a you know change of dates which keeps happening. So I would always uh, you know uh, request, and we would always have talks about ensuring that uh, we have a proper lead period which is justifiable as well as reasonable. And uh, of course, once the product comes in, the you know the the product how it is needs to be validated and checked on arrival whether it is a lab testing for the linen, or the procurement, or the batch testing for amenities, so on and so forth. So there is a lot of expectations, but I'm sure there's expectations from the other department as well, yeah. which is I, justified. I'm, I'm hoping you. that Mr. Francis and Mr. Gupta are making note of this. Uh, you will have your own turn to talk about them. So Mr. Banerjee, over to you. Yeah, uh, from an uh, engineering point of view, I must thank uh, procurement because without them, without their supports, we are not successful and they always back up the house, but for us, without them, nothing is possible. So please, from my side, is a thing. And what we want from uh, procurement, one is in our engineering uh, words, is called MTTR, mean time to repair of any equipment. Same things we want mean time to arrange. That should be very minimum, like uh, we cannot uh, put the equipment out of order if the space are not available. So we want that has to be minimized, that uh, duration. Uh, things should be available. Uh, same thing with the guest rooms. One day, if it is not available for the sales, there's a big losses are for us. So that is a very important we which we want. Uh, if we can get a help, it is there always. But sometimes, and plus, like my colleague rightly said, uh, any equipment which we are buying, there should be some self life of uh, 10 years or whatever. It, it should be managed. Plus, if we are buying some major equipment like chillers and other things. There should be a warranty should be included on those minimum five years or three years, which will help us to reduce the uh, R&M cost if the AMC included on those things. So that is all. So uh, thank you, sir. So the, these are not specific to any particular brand of the hotel. This is these are generic requirements yeah. from uh, both of you, uh, Mr. Francis and Mr. Gupta. Now uh, over to you. You have an opportunity to take the revenge now. And please tell us, what do you expect from the user department? Uh, no, no, there's no revenge. Indira is a very dear colleague. And we have our shares of disagreements. But at the end of the day, we also realize that we are working towards a common goal, which is guest satisfaction. If we have guest satisfaction, then at the end of the day, the guest will come back. If the guest comes back, then we are in business. Otherwise, we are, you know, we are not. Uh, a lot of the problem sometimes is that the departments are separate, you know engineering, housekeeping, FNB, kitchen. But the purchase person who does all of that in a lot of situations is the same. So today he might be buying a chiller, so he's talking about a certain aspect about engineering. Tomorrow he's buying a linen, so he has to kind of do a completely different flip and understand what is he talking about. So subject knowledge becomes a lot of issue. Why does subject knowledge become a lot of issue? Because if you look at the engineering function, our country has got a very efficient engineering education system. If you look at housekeeping, then again, you know, for example, at the Obroy and at a lot of the other institutions, you have institutes which polish you, which train you, and then only, you know, you are given the keys to the empire. What about procurement? In procurement, generally what happens is that anybody can be in procurement. There is no special skill that is required. So if you cannot do a lot of things, then you can at least do procurement. So usually the minimum benchmarks becomes that if you're a graduate, you can do procurement. Common sense ka hai to kaam hai. Isme dimaag kya lagana. Teen coat le kya ne aur jo cheapest hai wo dena hai. So when you start measuring at that lowest level and you aspire to have all the things like product knowledge, you aspire to have things like specification, you know, the person generally gets lost. So he also fulfill, he or she fulfills the main thing is that ki teen coat hai to life is good you know that then, then, then there's nothing else to be seen so we also have to emerge from this paradigm that we are not the three coat guys 
Okay, we are the people you uh, know who can stand hand in hand with engineering. I think there are very few procurement managers who can stand hand in hand with the chief engineer and have a discussion with the vendor. What does the procurement guy will normally ask? Lead time kitna hai? Advance loge ki nahi loge? Or you know warranty kitni hai? You know GST number ye hai? So that is generally the procurement contribution. They can't stand hand in hand with either housekeeping or engineering. So we need to upgrade their level, get them to a point and then they will also be able to you know, contribute in that manner. That, that is my feeling. I think the uh, stature and status of the procurement needs to rise from a pure, pure, really back of the house kind of an operation to somebody who impacts guest experience and comfort in a similar manner, in a similar setting. Then only you know, that contribution will, otherwise most procurement and 99.9% .9 are basically firefighters. They start their day by getting a whole tank load of water and you know dousing fires one after the other. So at the end of the day, you have nothing else to do. So the other day, you get another tank load of water and you start dousing fires. So which means that every time because you're dousing fires, you're basically the guy who is at the very last end of a crisis. And you are sometime about the crisis. Sometimes all the water in the world doesn't douse a crisis and then the blame game starts. So the guy needs to be empowered. He needs to come up to that level which means that we all, as hoteliers, need to look and see what we should do to improve that level. You know, then that kind of an experience will happen. Yeah. So, uh, in general, I'll say there is a lot of need to, you know, recognize the team spirit. End of the day, as uh, Francis was saying, all of us are working for a common goal, which is the guest delight. So, as long as the team spirit is there and there is a common understanding of each other's working processes, I think a lot of issues get resolved. And uh, also, the user department need to understand that the purchase people or procurement professionals are also, they are dealing with thousands to ten thousands of items. And uh, the product knowledge is not necessary. They might be good, they might be, as somebody said in the previous session, you need to have jack of all trades. But when you are procuring very high tech items, some of the technology items, or even the food items for that sake, you need to be knowledgeable, you need to be understanding, and they can't have that knowledge. So one of the good thing what we have realized is we, uh, at our uh, uh, office, what we have done is to form a committee. And a lot of interaction in, in the beginning to understand the specifications happens as, as a team. As a, so somebody is good in a technical product, some is good in those kind of products, they are able to define the right specification requirements for the first time. A lot of times we do realize that, you know, the specifications are not clear. And there are a lot of back and forth happening and you get the codes, as you said, three codes, and then you come and then suddenly you realize that the product is something else which we require, the model has to be different. A lot of time is wastage and then we talk about responsiveness, right? Where the responsiveness will be coming. And at the end of the day, even the vendor, we need to realize vendor has got, they are also not making everything by themselves. There is a kind of, manufacturing process, they are dependent on so many raw materials which are coming from so many countries or maybe from so many sub-suppliers. So the whole lead time, of course, it has to be very responsive but needs to be understood by the user department and hence comes the need for the materials pre-planning. My colleague uh, Rotin was just mentioning about the AMCs, yes, very good, spares, yes, but today when you buy any kind of equipment, even the manufacturer OEM tells you these are the critical spare parts which should be kept. And many times they give you some of them, you know, as spares. And when the life is getting over for the parts, one needs to understand that we need to reorder on time. But it, some emergencies can be dealt with, but every time if that becomes a norm, it becomes very difficult. So I think a lot of focus on teamwork, collective kind of explanation on the requirements, a material planning tool, that is very critical. So, so we plan in time and we order on time and appreciate the lead times which are possible. And please do understand that procurement professionals, they might be engineering background, there might be food technologists, whatever background they are, they will be good in that particular area. Nobody can take uh, a particular department's expertise. He can't be or she can't be that expert that is a particular department chef is or engineer is or X, Y, Z. So, so it needs to be much more collaborative, much more, much more planned way, which can ease out the things and, and foster this relationship 
and deliver a better value for the organization. Yeah. Thank you. Really talks about two major uh, points, which is knowledge sharing and seamless collaboration. So, ma'am, you also talked about the collaborative efforts in your uh, last answer. Uh, how important it is, it's knowledge sharing, like t today you have a junior purchasing professional sitting, or now you are in the central purchase, hence you have uh, the senior people. But imagine a purchase professional, say a assistant manager or an executive sitting there, uh, he doesn't know the product. So how important is knowledge sharing there? Means how can you ensure that the deliverables, uh, what are expected by you, are bought in through knowledge sharing? Uh, how does it help? Uh, so I think there are two things to this. One is, of course, the knowledge sharing. And the second part is, I think, what was mentioned by my co-panelist, uh, the specifications and the clarity of communication. Uh, so whenever you're asking from, for something, I think there should be, uh, the specification should be so detailed that it should be a foolproof. So it does not matter who's on the other side. If your SOP is uh, so detailed or if your, uh, what you're writing in your uh, requisition is so detailed and so specific, uh, it makes it easier for the procurement team to get it. Uh, when it comes to knowledge sharing, I think uh, knowledge is power. So uh, it is always good to, uh, and it, it goes both ways, right? Uh, we do not, I, I think the procure, I will disagree with Uso when he says that, you know, the procurement guys is a poor fellow who's a, who knows nothing, but I think uh, uh, they definitely have a uh, combined knowledge of so many departments put together. And uh, I empathize with them uh, because I understand that the, all the departments are rushing onto them and there's one poor fellow sitting there trying to appease all the you know, departments and like he said, firefighting all the time. Uh, but uh, yes, so I think knowledge sharing uh, both ways, communication both ways, and clarity of communication in terms of uh, the standard that you expect and specifications uh, should uh, be able to fix the problem if there is any. Thank really. you. Do you also maintain specification sheets for every product which are there in the organization? Yes, that ah. is uh, the basis and the basic that uh, uh, not only works towards product, but as well as processes. Okay. So any, uh, any good organization will definitely have that in place. And I think that's the basic that needs to yeah, be there so to that, make uh, life easy for all of us. So that brings in the consistency also of the product in cha chain of hotels, which all of you work in. Mr. Banerjee, question to you. Uh, we have seven minutes and I've got three questions. We'll close it quickly. Uh, how do you satisfy uh, and deliver to both internal and external customers uh, in this new era post-pandemic? Now expectations have gone up. Uh, just in time has come in. Uh, quantity has got down. The MOQs have gone down. And also the pricing expectation and the staff expectation has gone down. So how do you do it? Is, is there any specific uh, process, procedure do you follow? Or uh, what do you do? in the new expect expectations? See, today's uh, case, uh, the guest who's coming to us, he's well aware, he's very social media uh, uh, kind of person. He knows what is expected from the uh, hotels. So he goes each and every trail. So that is why we ensure once he's coming to us, we should give him a defective product to him. For that, we will, uh, having a robust uh, PM preventive maintenance rules for our uh, equipments for our rooms so that we try to and secondly now nowadays the customer is very focused about the quality of the air which is uh, very uh, evident because they want to we have the system in place uh, we lobby we have been pressurized uh, there's a uh, uh, filter system ESP filter systems are in place and we have a display in our lobby what is the air quality PM 2.5 we are maintaining those things very important, which is helping us. And we can see uh, when the com customer come back to us through our trust you feedback, though they are appreciating all our initiatives. Mr. Gupta, you talked about technology and digitization. Can you elaborate a bit uh, what has happened and what's going to happen next now, at least in procurement of hospitality industry? Uh, in the last two years and the era of uh, this, uh, you know, post-COVID next uh, times, which is, which is coming now and which is going to be there in the future, I think a lot of focus has come on the technology. Uh, during the COVID times, we have seen a lot of R&D innovation happening on the, on the contactless things, a lot of equipments which we work together with the uh, business partners 
to have disinfection or to have dustless elevators or to have UV radiation equipments uh, uh, to have. Now, taking forward from there, the expectations now are arising because disruption can happen anytime, anywhere. And you can't be just sitting delighted that the way you are working is it's fine. It's not fine. So, so uh, uh, right from the room reservation, for example, when you, uh, the customer wants today, his journey of the room reservation to outlet reservation is dustless. So you require those kind of software in form of the technology. Once he enters into the hotel, then again he wants that, can I enter into the room without any, any physical key? So touchless again. And then there comes the most important factor, which is IoT. We have already, you know, some of the hotels we have implemented IoT. Now IoT again takes out a lot of botheration and burden from the mind of the guest, right? Whether it's it's operating the in-room uh, kind of services, what we has from TV to AC to lighting, etc., or whether to even book some of the facilities and services within the hotel. You want to go to a restaurant, you want to book a particular slot without calling them, you can book on, on a kind of uh, online or app has become the way. So on the app you can book, you can go to the spa, you can have your appointment done, etc. So these are the, some of the factors, though the tax are there, these are expensive, but I think a lot of innovation will be happening and a lot of it will become, you know, kind of the common way, the common uh, facilities which most of the hotel groups will be having. Uh, apart from this, there will be a lot of uh, focus, I think, on, on uh, trends and analytics. So digitization will become uh, the norm, a lot of, you know, kind of e-procurement solutions, especially for supply chain management. Those, those will, uh, you know, um, uh, empower you to have a lot of analytics and, and take away and improve the efficiencies within the team and for the business. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, today, from a classical procurement, housekeeping, and engineering department, uh, we have really moved on. Uh, not just we are called the profit-making uh, departments because we not just save cost, but we are able to add into the profitability, the EBITDA, and the bottom line of the organization. Uh, that's because of these people. And we, all of you, the owners of the organizations, the management uh, people, need to recognize that. Many times there is no support, uh, many times there is no recognition. It's expected that what we are doing is our job. But if you give a little bit of pat on the back, I'm sure the results will be much better. So thank you for, uh, for your participation uh, panel, and thank you for listening to us.